Welcome back to Sparks 18. We're with Dr. Kelly Ballantyne and we are now going to relay some of the questions we've received over Twitter and um, get some great responses. Okay. So firstly, thank you for both parts of your fantastic talk. You're welcome. Really enjoyed them, as did everyone watching from yeah. home. Um, I guess one of the things I'd like to start about, and perhaps it's an opportunity to talk about the process of a veterinary behaviourist, mm -hmm. is someone's, uh, I guess, got in touch and said they have a dog that has a history um, of having been exposed to aversive training methods. Mm -hmm. It's now been rehomed into their, their house, their family home. Um, they notice that this dog shows some um, pacing, sort of anxious kind of behaviours in certain situations. They think when the dog's not so sure what it's meant to be doing socially okay. um, and that they either politely interrupt it or just let it settle down. Mm -hmm. um, is there something else that they should be doing? Is there a question to you? And I guess I'm, I'm just curious, like, what do you do with that information? <laughs> yeah, so I guess I would answer with possibly, but um, we would need a lot of more information in order to figure out what would be most effective for that particular patient. So um, as veterinary behaviorists, um, not only do we collect that really extensive behavioral history questionnaire, but when we're doing consultations with our clients, we're often talking to them about, okay, what is the behavior that they're concerned about? And then what are all of the conditions in which they might be seeing that behavior? What are potential triggers? You know, what's going on? Um, and we also like to have really clear descriptions of what the behavior looks like. So rather than... Um, you know, sometimes we'll have clients that come in and they might give their dog certain labels of my dog's anxious or my dog's aggressive or my dog's fearful. That really doesn't give us enough detail to know what's going on. We want to know what the behavior looks like, like what exactly that dog is doing. And then like how that situation then ends, you know, what does the animal get or get away from by exhibiting that behavior? So then we can start figuring out, okay, we're going to do X, Y, Z, you know, whether that be environmental management or behavior modification modification or medication or a combination of those factors in order to figure out what's going or what's going to help that pet the most. So just um, touching off that, people very often have an idea of where or why the behavior appeared. So mm -hmm. some people will say maybe he does this because he's a rescue or somebody oh, must have right. hit him. Or So you have a wide range of possible mm -hmm. factors mm -hmm. that may or may not have occurred. Right. And how do you, how does that play into your work with owners and their dogs? Yeah. Well, um, I mean, as Chris was saying the other day, it's genotype plus phenotype, or mm -hmm. I'm, genotype plus the environment mm -hmm. equals phenotype. Mm -hmm. So we can say there's probably some genetic factors. Mm -hmm. There's probably some environmental factors. But if we don't have a history, like we can't make any... Declare. Yeah, and say like, oh right. yes, this dog must have been right. abused. And sometimes we'll see dogs that engage in certain behaviors where we know their whole life history yeah. And, um, you know, they might act as if they were abused. So you, you know, just raise your tone of voice just a little bit and they pancake on the floor like, ah. and there's been no history of abuse whatsoever. Right. So we can't even take those behaviors and say, oh, certainly this dog must have been abused. Right. And that's why they're doing that behavior. So, so when you hear an owner say that, mm -hmm. how, how do you process it? Do you, you know? Does it? Um, then that's nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I will say that I... Yes, I don't necessarily take that into account because what I'm interested in, what's going on right now, right. and then how can we change mm -hmm. the environment or the training techniques mm -hmm. or introduce some behavior modification to help that dog then cope in the future and become mm -hmm. more resilient for the future. And the past is in the past. Mm -hmm. We can't change it. Yeah. Can't do anything That's about it. Heard. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. have it's you heard in, that too? I have heard it's that. good information. Yeah. Now let's move forward. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I guess on that note, someone else has asked, do you have a difference of approach based on size of the mm -hmm. dog? Mm -hmm. So let's say, for example, with a fear issue, would you have a different approach if it's a small dog versus if it's a large dog? No, I would say, uh, you know, to give a general answer, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, our approach, because we're treating dogs, so we treat dogs as if they're dog, regardless of their body shape. And so we're probably going to use the same kind of methods in terms of trying to manage the environment, trying to teach them behaviors we want them to do, trying to help improve. If they're coming into us for something like fear or anxiety, trying to improve the way they feel about mm -hmm. situations in which they get stressed. And that different, that, that, method is not going to change very much based on that patient's 
physical size. So to that point, um, at the same time, they do take on so many shapes and their ability to communicate and signal oh, right. yeah. varies. So how do you deal with that when mm -hmm. you have d um, different dogs coming in that owners may or may not see those signals because mm -hmm. they might not be present? What, what do you, right. How do you help them? Yeah, so that's a really great question, Julie. And I think that highlights the importance of getting people to describe mm -hmm. what behavior they're seeing mm -hmm. so we can figure out what signals that particular individual dog uses mm -hmm. rather than just coming at it from a blanket statement like, well, all dogs look, lick their lips when they're stressed. Right. It's not necessarily true. Right. They might have a different mode of communicating yeah. mm -hmm, yeah. as an individual. Um, I, Moving on to the, yeah. the people component. Yeah. I'm gonna go yes, that's to the people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the people? Or yes. Want, yeah. um, so I guess one of the questions is that you are working with people who mm -hmm. bring in their dogs yeah. and people are learning possibly new information. Yes. That is, you know, they were over here and now you're telling them something maybe over here. Mm -hmm. um, do you see something happen on their face, some sort of cognitive dissonance where they're like, whoa, and I'm, I've been over here and yeah. now there's over here. And how do you help them as a human with that process of transition? Yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I get a whole range of responses to the information that I provide based on the individual humans mm -hmm. that I see. You know, I, I can sometimes see based on the, their body language that they're kind of shutting down, like maybe that information is hard to hear. Um, in some cases, I might get clients that then um, become defensive as, mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty normal given yeah. the situation, like feeling like you're doing something bad. It's pretty normal to react defensively. And then I also um, will sometimes have clients that start crying or they feel really bad because now they're realizing you know that some of the things they might have been doing with their dog is actually contributing to a problem. It can be yeah. just through like switching on their eyes to being able to read the dog's body language a little bit yeah. more. Yeah. Like that. yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah. sometimes we'll get, because we talk a lot about um, communication and body language in our consultations, and then we'll get clients reaching out to us after the consultation are like, oh my God, my dog's panting all the time or he's licking his lips all the time or he's always yawning when I'm petting him. Like, oh, is my dog scared all the time? And it's, it is hard. Like when you start learning those things, then you're picking it up mm -hmm. and you can't unsee it. Right. So it can yeah. be tough, but it's where I come from. It's, it, that's important information. And then we can use that information to then change and improve. Mm -hmm. um, but I also come to these consultations from the perspective that everybody's doing the best that they can, mm -hmm. given the tools that they have available and to the them at the time. Yes, the absolutely. Sure. And a lot of people come to me and they've been given a lot of misinformation from other mm -hmm. sources, whether that be a trainer or another veterinarian mm -hmm. or their brother-in-law yeah. or who knows what, you know? Yeah, yeah. and we know, we know from the psychological <laughs> research that people tend to give more credence Yes. to family members and friends as information sources than they do to professionals. Yes. So, you know, yes. which, is, <laughs> right. which is, you know, a real confounding factor to trying to get out best practice, uh -huh. you know, evidence-based new information. Right. Yeah. And I'll, I'll run into clients very frequently where they might have been going to a trainer where the client was uncomfortable with the training methods used mm -hmm. and in this situation felt really bad for their dog or like, I don't want to do this to my dog, but that person is telling me it's what to do. And yeah. they kind of get... Um, swayed by the expert yeah. opinion, mm -hmm. you know, and do what they think mm -hmm. they're supposed to do. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it's real sticky. <laughs> yeah, it is. But I think it's important to touch on too, that it mm -hmm. is normal if you have been doing something and then you get new information that conflicts with that. It's, it's very normal to go through that feeling of discomfort. Absolutely. And there's no problem in acknowledging, oh, now I have new information. Yes. Things have changed. I can do better right. now. Yeah. The problem only really lies if you don't adapt and change your practices going forward yeah. with that new information on board. Well, and I guess even with that, I mean, I totally agree with the fact that it's, yeah, it's real normal to feel uncomfortable and feel um, perhaps bad when you realize, oh, I was doing all this stuff and, and that's, you know, contributed to the problem. But I would also say like when I, the way that I try to approach my consultations and what happens afterwards is that even when people maybe don't do what I recommend or go a different way, I also feel like, well, there are other drivers for that decision. You know, mm -hmm. they might have other priorities or other things going on in their lives yeah. that impair their ability to like make the changes that I might be recommending. Yeah. 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 yeah that's, that's it. And I guess on that note, um, 
someone else has sort of mentioned that sometimes seeking the assistance of a specialist like yourself can be expensive yes. and may be prohibitive for some people, mm -hmm. maybe out of reach. So yeah. I guess we're wanting to ask you, if people are in that situation, what other resources are available to them or what other avenues can they take in, in terms of getting help? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I think one of the first things I would say is if uh, a person is noticing a behavioral problem in their dog, whether it be a chronic condition or something, especially if it's something that crops up acutely, like mm -hmm. it, it, it's new and it's an adult dog, well then the first step is just going into your veterinarian and getting uh, having them do a physical exam and just check for some physical health conditions mm -hmm. because that might actually be driving that um, mm -hmm. change in behavior. Mm -hmm. And so um, from that, then, uh, you know, not all animals need to come see a veterinary behaviorist. Mm -hmm. Like some behavioral issues are amenable to training and behavior modification alone. And mm -hmm. thankfully there are um, more and more trainers who are getting really well educated on the science behind learning mm -hmm. and behavior modification techniques that can help a lot of people. And um, there are also more and more resources available to our pet owners as well. And I would give a shout out to Decoding Your Dog, mm -hmm. which is a book that was written by several of my colleagues in the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. Um, the American uh, Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior also has a ton of excellent resources on their website. Mm -hmm. So they have um, position statements not only on breed-specific legislation, but also on puppy socialization and training techniques. Mm -hmm. And they have a really lovely guide to how to choose a dog trainer. Yep. Yep. So for people who are looking like they don't know who to look for, it gives them a nice mm -hmm. uh, outline of yeah. what to look for and what to avoid. And so let's say somebody goes to their vet, they receive some information, Kind of comparing that with the AVSAP position statements, yes, very useful. Absolutely, yeah, very very useful. You have that right there, uh -huh. just to check. Right. Mm hmm. Yep. And if someone does feel, I mean, they get some information from a vet or from someone else, and they're not sure that it's the best advice, mm -hmm. what would you recommend to them in terms of getting a second opinion or mm -hmm. um, reaching out? You know, rather than just, I guess. Sometimes if you get that gut feeling, oh, I'm not sure this is yeah. what's best for my individual animal. Right. Where else could they go? Well, I guess I would answer that first with saying it's always important to follow your gut. Like, um, people know their animals the best of anybody else. Mm -hmm. So um, they're the most informed to make that decision. And then if, let's say, they're going to their veterinarian and they're not really sure about the recommendations that are being made, um, if they go on that AVSAB website, there's also a really nice resource in terms of finding veterinarians who have an interest in behavior mm -hmm. and who know a lot more about behavior than the average general practitioner. So that could be a really great resource as well. Fantastic, yeah. Well, we, um, I guess before we wrap up, mm -hmm. um, I guess I would just have you touch on um, when you are working with clients mm -hmm. um, and they, they come to you with, with questions or concerns, um, what is something that you've really seen change over your practice over time? Like in terms of how you started and mm -hmm. where you where you started from and what you've seen over time. Like what's something you've seen kind of change? Okay, so I have a two part answer to Excellent. that question. <laughs> Excellent. So one of the things that I have thankfully seen change mm -hmm. over the last. Um, now I'm trying to remember how many years <laughs> I've years. been doing this. Yes, the oh. last many years <laughs> yes. um, is that um, I'm seeing a lot fewer people coming into me having used aversive training methods in their dogs before they get to me. Wow. So that has been lovely. Mm -hmm. I I've actually been seeing more and more clients who seem to be uh, really well educated in. Um, the fact that fear and anxiety tend to be, drive a lot of these unwanted mm -hmm. behaviors and they're already putting some things into place that are really helping their dogs. Mm -hmm. So that's been a really great change because when I started, um, it was in the heyday of a lot of um, punishment-based methods and things like alpha rolling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was, cre I was seeing a lot of owner-directed aggression mm -hmm. um, because of wow. a lot of those techniques. So that's been a really great change. Um, the thing that I would say that I'm changing in my own mm -hmm. practice is I'm always trying to figure out how can I make the treatment as 
easy as possible to integrate to yep. a client's day-to-day -day yep. life. Their personal day-to-day -day life. Exactly. Making it as feasible as possible to actually have Yeah, to and just integrate it so it really doesn't take a lot of effort, but it's effective. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. On that note, that is a wonderful note to conclude this question and answer period. And thank you all for watching. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for Dr. Kelly Ballantyne. And we will see you back here after lunch. Um, so we'll be back here at 1.30 Eastern Daylight Time. And have a wonderful lunch um, or doing whatever you're doing. Thanks for the pictures, too. <laughs> That's right, yeah.